the Ohio Arts Council's Rife Gallery Artist Talk Series for our current show, the 2021 Biennial Juried Exhibition, juried by April Tsunami, Jessamy Jones, and Kevin Lyles. Today, we're thrilled to present Jimmy Jones, one of our 53 exhibiting artists. But first, there are just a few housekeeping items to go over. Everyone tuning in today is in listen-only mode, so feel free to utilize the chat function there in your control panel to ask questions. We will monitor those questions throughout the presentation and be sure to leave plenty of time to answer them at the end during the Q&A portion of the hour. Next, live captioning is available for this artist talk and you can access those captions by clicking on the closed captioning icon at the bottom and select show subtitle. Also, please keep in mind that because we're presenting from separate locations, there may be some variation of bandwidth for internet stability. So if one of us freezes up or the sound fluctuates, thank you in advance for bearing with us. I promise we'll keep rolling through any technical difficulties. And lastly, to get everyone comfortable, go ahead and click on the chat function in your control panel to say hello and let us know where you're tuning in from. Okay, thanks all. And now to you, Jimmy. Well, good morning, everybody. And thanks for taking the time to listen to me. And the name of my talk is gonna be about Between Worlds. I, I always felt that as an artist, I was always between at least two different worlds. One of uh, Western European art and the other one of uh, West African art. And the other one was uh, between being a designer and being a painter. I'm gonna, some of the things I'm gonna talk about today is where I'm from, a little bit about my education, uh, some of my study habits, some of my processes. And I'm from Western North Carolina in the Smoky Mountains, so I'm an Appalachian person. And um, we moved uh, to the North, for my dad to get a new job. We moved to Green Hills, Ohio. And of course I played football. And this is one of my first drawings I did. I did this when I was a, a kid. And uh, everybody always wants to know a little bit about my ancient history. <laughs> and this is one of my first drawings, a lady and a little baby. Uh, one of the other things I did was I, I worked as an engineer in my early life and I did some sketches of some of the airplanes I worked on and airplane engines and all that type of stuff. So I'm um, technically versed as well as artistic. One of the things I was talking about before, I'm always between two worlds. Down at the bottom is a representation of some of the graphic work I do. And at the top is one of the big paintings I did. So I'm, I'm between those two worlds at this point. And the other thing is I was uh, a designer and I went to design school at the University of Cincinnati. And I was one of two artists that they brought back to work to represent the decade of the 70s. One is Michael Barut and myself. We represented the 70s at uh, University of Cincinnati Design, Art and Architecture. Michael Barut is one of the best designers in the world right now. So I'm always glad to be pictured with him. I wanted to show you how my early start was, was graphic design. So I, I did a lot of black and white studies. And so it taught me how to be detail oriented and how to draw straight lines. I can draw straight lines. One of the other things I did is I wanted to also take my graphics into my drawing. So I wanted to create uh, logos, people as logos. So that's why the hard edges and the straight lines are there. So then I moved on from the straight lines to more drawing. So the mass, the African mass started to seep into my work and I wanted to see how far I could push the face using some of the African techniques that I've seen and done in the past. So some images look more like a face and some look like the mass, of course. After I used the images to create mass, one of the things I wanted to do is study uh, color. Since I'm a design student more than I am a painter, 
I wanted to do colors, so I limited my palette to just three colors, yellow, red, and uh, blue. And I created a whole series of drawings that were an integration of the mass, as well as using my three colors. And that's what these images went. So some look real mass-like, and the other ones look realistic. One of the other things I did like when I got out of, out of college is I wanted to start studying the human body. So I started, take, I started going to classes with models and I, I still kept some of the characteristics of the African mass in there, but I really wanted to study the human body since I was a design student, not a fine art student. So that's what I did. So I, to this day, still sketch the human body Every week I go draw. And then I have some uh, models come to my studio and I do images of them. So I'm integrating, I'm, I'm actually teaching myself how to paint as well as studying the human body. One of the other things I did when I got out of college is I wanted to study animals. So I created this, this piece and the Cincinnati Art Museum loves this piece. And so I wanted to create movement, color. I wanted to expand my notion of color or my range of color. And I wanted to create a movement in this piece. And this is an animal. One of the other things I did since I was in design school is I set up my own program so I could go to the museum and I would just sketch all the great artists that I saw there. And so I would sit down and create my own compositions by looking at some of the masters. And I, I looked at every piece I could look at and I actually traveled around the world to see the different museums as well. And I, I learned and taught myself composition, as you can see right here. And then some of the pieces I thought were funny. So rather than just copy these master's pieces, I would take two or three different paintings and combine them together. That's why this is the daughter of the American Revolution. And I thought they were funny and they look real proper and prim. So I put that funny little lady down at the bottom. It was a joke, it was fun. I was trying not to take myself too serious. Then one of the things I did is I, I wanted to really immerse myself into the art world. So I, I formed a group called the Neo Ancestralists. And we, we formed this group to look at African art, African American art, and combine it with European art. And we came up with this movement called Neo Ancestralism. And just to give you some idea, Neo Ancestralism simply means taking old ancestral things and bringing them up to a modern time, making them new. Uh, one of the other things with neo-ancestralism is we did a lot of found art. And one of the artists that I, I like is Rauschenberg. And Rauschenberg did basically the same thing. He just walked around and grabbed, he would take one block each direction and find objects that he would make into art. So he's one of my favorite artists. And this is called the wall. One of the other things I did is in my garage, I actually built the, the temple that you see there. And this is the Last Supper. And it was in a show at the Western Art Gallery in Cincinnati. Uh, that piece is all done with magic marker. And I used the magic marker so it would make me slow up and really look at details and draw. You have to draw every little single little line. And I didn't use but one magic marker so that the grays that you see are all done by just holding the brush or the pen up just slightly higher. And to get darker colors, I'd push in there harder. So as you can see, it has graphic elements as well as drawn elements. And that's me combining my design with my art.
this was a book that was done in this, uh, it's at the Library of Congress in Washington, DC. This was a book done on the group, the Neo Ancestralists. And that's the cover of it, just in case you guys want to go out and buy it. Now, what I want to do is talk just a little bit about my more contemporary process. And what I did is I wanted to paint like, like the masters, like Rembrandt and Van Gogh. And I, what I did is I used a process where I started with three different colors. The first one that you see there on your left is burnt umber. And I'm not sure how familiar you guys with paint, but burnt umber is a, uh, oh, a warmer brown. And then I moved from the warmer brown to a burnt umber, which is the darker brown. So I'm starting to get three dimensionality to it. And believe it or not, the third color I used was blue. So when I use the blue, it starts to look more realistic, more three dimensional. So that's the color process I use. And the paints I use is Old Holland, Old Holland paints. They're very expensive, but they last forever. So that was a good move in doing that. Next, what I wanted to do is, I, as, as far as concepts are concerned, I see myself as a storyteller. So I broke my concepts up into smaller groups. One is uh, historical stuff. And I also, this picture right here shows uh, Cameron Kitchen and Julie Aronson, they both visit my studio. And, and Julie is the curator of 20th century art at the Cincinnati Art Museum. And Cameron is the director. And they spent a whole day, well, actually two days in my studio looking at all my, my art. So that was a true honor and a pleasure. This uh, winter, uh, a magazine is going to use me as part of their presentation. And one of my magazine, I'm, uh, actually that piece is my piece on the cover and it's gonna be used in the magazine. So it should be on the shelves uh, sometime this winter. I hope, I'm looking forward to it. Now this is me at a show at the Springfield Art Museum. And the Springfield Art Museum has a big space in it. So every time I would go up there to see the art, they would bring out this big old comfy chair and allow me to sit there and just take a look at my work. I never, as a painter, you don't really get a chance to enjoy your own work that much because you're too busy working. So I got a chance to swivel around in this chair and just enjoy looking at some of my paintings. And some of them I hadn't seen for years. So it was good to see them on a wall like that, a nice clean wall, and I was able to see them and it was great fun. Now this was a show I had with, with Kat at the Rife Gallery and it's not my show myself, but I was with a group of Af artists, African-American artists. It was called the Ohio Diasporas and it was a tremendous show. Thank you, Kat. Okay, I'm breaking up the uh, concepts into smaller groups. And one of the groups is I love jazz. And so I started taking some of my graphic elements and integrating them with great jazz musicians. And this is John Coltrane, who's a great artist. I call him an artist. He's a musician. This is Miles Davis. And as you can see in the background, there's lots of graphic elements in there. So I love integrating graphics I found myself once I started to integrate graphics with painting. Uh, and, and I just I just love the graphic parts too. Miles Davis. This is Billie Holiday. And I'm still working on some of these paintings. I still might want to put some color into the face, but right now I'm I'm leaving it right there because I like to look at some of my pieces for a while and they talk to me. They either tell me to put some more color on the face or do something like that. But most of the time I just let them sit there and I can look at them. 
So this is Billie Holiday. And then I did this piece called The Geniuses of Jazz. Now these four jazz musicians, Dizzy Gillespie, uh, Monk, and Miles Davis, and Coltrane, they obviously never worked together like this, but I wanted to put them all in one composition. And the composition was, was centered in a church and also a, a bar because I put the two together. And uh, if you wanna study African-American music, it, it starts in the church. So that's why I have it centered in the church there. The next thing I did is I wanted to try creating a little bit more movement with my paintings and add a little bit more graphic to them. And that's what this piece shows. Stories and politics. I, I wanted to, the, these pieces, this piece here is 12 feet long and it's, a, it's an integration of politics and some of the great artists that I love, like Raphael is the centerpiece in the center there. So I'm integrating Western culture with African-American culture in this one. And uh, just, just for you guys' sake, some of the people that are pictured here, number one is uh, John Kennedy. That's Martin Luther King right above him. And it looks kind of abstract, so some people can't see that face. And then there's uh, Lincoln. And then there's Martin Luther King at the uh, Lorraine Hotel after he was shot. So anyway, this piece is six feet by 12 feet. And I did a total of like eight different big format paintings. And... I stole my name from Jimi Hendrix, the great musician. So that's why I changed my name to Jimi and I grew my hair out really big because it seems like he had an entourage of ladies that followed him. I don't know if that worked too much. And Cassie, I know you're out there, so you might say Chris will, Chris will stop me from this. So. Now this piece right here is called Two Smokes. And it was, I don't know if you remember a few years ago, there was, we had two popes and the two popes, they weren't sure if one pope was still gonna leave and the other one was gonna take over, but they were waiting for the enclave to happen. And when, and they were waiting for one of the smokes to signify that one of the popes had been chosen as, as the leader of the Catholic church. But if you see right there at the bottom left-hand side, there's a puff of smoke. But that puff of smoke was showing how the news cycles can change so fast because in the middle of the Boston Marathon, the two, one of the brothers that is pictured here, they exploded a bomb. And when they exploded that bomb, it, it destroyed the marathon, the Boston Marathon, but it also took the popes off the front page of the news. Hence called the two smokes. The one smoke is the, the bomb that exploded and the other smoke is the one that we're waiting to see that signifies our new pope. Now, now this painting right here is primarily the, uh, it's called the Mad Hatter's Tea Party. Now some of the people that are pictured here are the Koch brothers. And that's the guy that's in the center with the the blue shirt on, he's asking Marie Antoinette and little Alice if he could join their tea party. Now, if you look right in back of his hand, there's a guy with a tri hat on. He is actually the founder of the tea party and he's trying to convince them not to let this guy in. But this was right after the time that the, uh, the Koch brothers had actually purchased the Tea Party. So they were total control of it. So there was a battle between the old Tea Party people and the Koch brothers. And if you notice, the Tea Party has kind of been awful silenced once the Koch brothers took it over. And I put the little cartoon characters in there because 
sometimes my art can get overly serious, way too serious. So I put the little elements in there, the little cartoonish elements in there, just so that little kids, it's right at the height that they can see them, they would enjoy some part of that painting as well. Uh, this, this painting is called, Who's the Real Cowboy? And what I was trying to depict on there is uh, some of the young hip hop people that are out there now, I wonder <laughs> if they're not cowboy like in all the shooting and maiming and all that kind of stuff that's going on right now, who is the real cowboy? And then those, those depictions that you see dead center, it shows TV cowboys and it shows real cowboys on there. So our image, of cowboys are the ones that we see on the television set. They're not the real cowboys. They're just TV and movie actors pretending to be cowboys. So that's what that piece represents. Who's the real cowboys? This one here is called the sweet science. And what I was trying to depict in there is that some people, well, a lady came up to me and she says, oh my God, I really hate that painting. And I says, why do you hate it so much? He says, because the blood, it's blood on there. And I says, thank you so much because you said blood instead of red paint. So as an artist, I was really, that, that struck me because whether she likes it or not, I made an impact on it. And the image that's in the far, this is in the foreground or, or in the foreground here is a picture of Mike Tyson. And it was a perfect opportunity to take that ear and take a bite mark out of it. That would show his last fight when he was getting beat, he bit the ear of a person. So he was a, just a plain mean guy, but I said, no, don't bite his little ear, don't do it. And so, Anyway, Mike Tyson now, he's holding a dove in his hand because that's what he does now. He raises doves. And this one is called, Sometimes I Just Feel Like Fighting. And then again, I put that little cartoon character in there to keep it from being too serious. This piece actually represents the different times that human beings have abused each other and hurt each other. And so I said one day, all this stuff will be old and be put into a museum and it'll be a relic of the past. And we won't have to deal with the, the brutality that, and everything that goes on now. And that's why I put it in a museum situation. On the left-hand side, that is a painting called the Fifth March by friend by Goya. So people have been hurting and abusing each other for centuries. So this is not a new thing. Uh, this painting is called the SS Turner and, and that field of red that you see that's down there actually represents blood. And it's the blood, if you look at a, a a Turner painting, he did a painting that showed people being thrown overboard and eaten by sharks and everything. And they, they reddened up the water. So I was more or less warning people in that there's talk about some kind of a revolution or something that's going on in America. Well, if you start thinking revolution, people die in that. It's nothing to play with. So I'm trying to warn us against trying to do anything that's gonna hurt ourselves and each other. That's what that painting represents. Questions, anybody? This yeah, one's- We have some good questions coming up and we can continue looking at your works, Jimmy. Um, mm -hmm. We had a question about why, why is it important to adopt classical techniques for painting in your work today? Could you speak a little bit about that? Yeah, one, one of the things I wanted to do is, since I'm telling a story and it's, it's storytelling, I didn't want a lot of ambiguity in there. So I learned, uh, 
and taught myself and took classes and everything so I could become a classical painter so that my images become iconic. They're icons that everybody can understand and they don't have, they may have to figure out the subject matter, but they are iconic in the way they are developed. So I, I thought that was really necessary in order to tell my stories. Jimmy, we also had a question about, um, in some of your paintings, you have figures rendered in color and others that um, use just the, the Bert Sienna um, underpainting color, right? So is there significance in that? I know that you chatted a bit about waiting and allowing the, the painting to kind of inform you of the progress that you need to, to endeavor upon, but I'm also curious in some of those where you make the choice to keep some uh, rendered with value and some rendered with color if those are uh, for content reasons. Could you talk, talk a little bit about that? Well, the primary thing is as I have a process that I go through and my job as an artist is to use, I use the same process on this painting as well as any other painting. And, and the neat thing that I found out is I have people stop in at the studio sometimes and they see it at different levels. And, and, and I've noticed that people go, oh, I like that. And obviously I'm not finished with it. I'm at one of those levels that you just talked about. And I said, wait a minute, I'm fighting against what people are telling me. So I allow some of my process, which is the same process over and over again, to stop at whatever stage that feels good and comfortable. If people read that as an image that I want them to read, then I should stop there. There's no rule that says I have to finish it complete with color. It's my rule, it's my game. So I use those techniques to have people ask me questions like you just did, which is spectacular to me when they say, they ask me just the question that you just said. When they do that, I know I'm painting and I'm not following some rule that even I set for myself. I just stop whenever I want. So when people come to my studio, one of the goals I try to show them, I says, it's your painting. You can stop whenever you want. So I've been teaching myself how to be really good at even the very earliest stage. Because each painting is painted like that first one I showed you before. So that each stage is a well done document of my process. So what I'm, if there's any distinctions to be made, it's by the viewer. If the viewer sees something different in that than a painted one, it's on them. It's not on me. It's not my job. Okay, sorry. Any more? We have many comments uh, saying, uh, your work is phenomenal. Thank you for giving us a peek into your process and the stories behind the incredible paintings. Uh, Jimmy, this is so exciting. Thank you for sharing your awesomeness with us today. Um, and then uh, another that said, I'm so proud of you, Jimmy. So plenty of folks saying, wow, and, and congratulations on your work. Um, and I'll keep you posted on questions. Yeah, keep on going. Yeah, am I allowed to finish now? <laughs> Thank you. And thanks for all the nice comments. I appreciate that. This is called the death of innocence. And, and, and it's about the, the young kid that was killed um, a few years ago. And I was having a problem with the fact that nobody sees the dead body down at the bottom. And so I put a little baby's face there and a mother so that the audience that's looking at my paintings would stop and go, what the hell is Jimmy trying to tell us with this painting? And uh, I wanted to make sure that the idea that a mom, any mom 
doesn't want to lose their kid to any type of violence, even to a vigilante. That's what this painting is about. Okay, this one is called Dark Night Aurora. And this was one of the earliest ones of those mass murders that's been taking place. Oh, sorry, my phone was ringing. <laughs> sorry about that. Oh, I'll continue. Look, this one's called Dark Night Aurora. And this is the person, James Holmes. And I thought, I thought his face and the hair and everything was just interesting to see what a mass murderer looks like. And it could be anybody walking on the street, even though this guy looks just a little out of there. So anyway, it's called Mass Murder Aurora. And, and this, this painting what happened in Ferguson and it's a little suburb uh, east of St. Louis. And I just thought it was just unfathomable that they left, they not only shot the kid, but they left him out in the middle of the street, no covering over him, no nothing. And that just bothered me to no end. So I worked at Procter & Gamble, so I stole the Tide Target <laughs> and made it. Hold on, let me go back. So that's what this picture is about. And I put like a, a red circle over his heart to just signify that a lot of, lot of people are targets nowadays. And, and this, this piece right here is, is the person, uh, Dylan Roof. And he killed nine African-Americans in a church in, in Charleston. South Carolina. So I thought, wow, look how young his little face looks. And, it, and this was done a few years ago. So now when I saw that young guy on television the other day, it's like uh, there is people getting younger and younger. So it just bothered me. So I thought I would just document that. Now, one of the things I wanted to say is I was starting to get a little weary of doing all these paintings about people being mass murdered and killed and all that stuff. So it was driving me nuts. Now, this piece right here is actually Colin Kaepernick. Uh, and I was actually saying, and when I did this piece, I knew that one day this piece would be relegated to a museum or something because it's old stuff. And now I see the politicians are still using this as a way to get votes and stuff, but this is old. This, this is old stuff. Jimmy, we have a couple more comments I'll read out to you. Yeah, sure. Um, we have one that said, thank you for such an acute observation of people, iconic and ironic, wonderful work. We have wow. another comment or question actually. I'm curious, how many paintings are you working on currently? Also, do you set a goal to achieve X amount of paintings per year? Or is it more about what's moving you in the media and your research? Well, well, one of the things that's happened is I got so weary of all the stuff that goes on in the media and on the and I, so I was trying to keep up <laughs> with, with all the murders and all the mayhem that goes on. So I decided, oh, enough's enough. I'm, I'm starting to become mean spirited. So I got to get away from those things. So I try not to follow the news too much anymore. And I'll tell you, after I go through a couple more slides here, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you what I'm doing. But no, I don't sit on it. I used to paint more when I was younger, but now it's more uh, I'm painting something to tell a story that's gonna that's gonna live in people's memory. Before I was just hungry to get paintings out there. I just love painting so much, so I just couldn't stop. I was like a shark swimming in the water. So no, I don't sit a number of paintings to do, and I usually work on at least three paintings at a time. And each one of those paintings are in those levels that you talked about earlier, Kat. 
you know, they're at some level there. And, and it, after I paint on another painting, it might say, put some color right there, Jimmy. But I never know at the time exactly what it's going to end up looking like. Like it took me forever to put the purple in the background for purple rain. It just took me forever to get that to that point. We have another great question for you. Um, Love that. Can you talk more about how you choose the images? They seem to be a combination of pop culture, historical images, and current events. Do these start as collages in your mind? And then as an addendum to that, there's also some futurist visual elements that tie all of the imagery together as well. How do futurist motifs elevate your work or the stories you tell? So that's a that's a nice thick question for you. You can take take some time with. I, I'll take a bite on that one. Well, one of the things is you got to remember, and I try to tell you this throughout my lecture here. I am a designer. I design stuff to happen. I spend time on designing. And if you notice, my process has lots of steps. So even before I even put a brush to canvas, I, I might spend a month on just the concept alone. And it, it changes. I, I wish I had time to show you how many changes a single painting goes through before it makes it to the canvas. Because I'm a, di I'm a designer and I love just designing art. If I, could, if I could just design them, which is a futuristic way of looking at them and let them become art, I, I'd have 20 pieces per painting. So yes, I use uh, a future tools to help me in development, but I'm just a designer. I'm just always amazed when somebody says, Jimmy, you can paint. Because I'm not a painter. I'm just a design designer by heart. So now, Jimmy, I don't I don't think they're mutually exclusive. So so you know, give yourself a little credit there. I think you can be both. Well, I I I I've fought that battle before. And it's not a battle with anybody else other than myself. It's, it's me telling myself. Teach yourself how to paint. That's what you want to do. But don't lose your design ability. Don't exclude one for the other. So my goal is to integrate the two things so they're integrated enough. And actually, that's that's nothing new. All, all painters used to be designers. And they should be right now. But I don't I don't know enough to tell you that for sure. But yeah, it used to be there was no separation, except for one was a commercial venture and the other one was a fine arts venture. But they obviously are coming together nowadays. People are seeing it. So yes, did that answer the question or should yeah, I, I think I think you got through a, a good portion of that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I am sure that that person will ask more questions if they want a more nuanced answer. So yeah, go for it. I wish they would, yeah. Okay, I'm gonna keep moving, okay? This this part is about stories and faces. Now, what I was trying to get to is I was getting tired of all the politics and everything. Absolutely tired of it. It was making me crazy. And now I couldn't keep up with it if I tried. So I stopped, so I said, what I wanted to do now is start to focus in on more of the interbeing instead of the exterior stuff that was going on in the news. So I chose one of my models came over and they brought their little baby with them. And uh, I looked at the baby and I says, well, that baby can't sit there long enough to let me do a drawing of him. And the little baby looked at me like he's looking at me and going, Jimmy, I got this. <laughs> That little baby looked at me like, who are you talking about? I can do it. So one of the things I wanted to do that I wanted to show you in this painting is, of course, her arms didn't stay out in the, in the, uh, oh, I guess the configuration that they are in now. I actually made them that way. So it would look like 
instead of us always thinking as of Jesus as being like a, a male, why couldn't it be a little girl or a lady? So I put its little arms like it was making a cross, like its body was on a cross in a sense. Of course, I didn't want to do it in the, the brutal manner that the, the Jesus the Christ was put in. So that's what I did that for. And I just thought the round part of the head there, oh, I made all that up. But I just love doing that little round head like that. I thought that was so interesting. So anyway, I move on. I digress. This is my pal Tommy. He's one of the guys that's pictured in a, a piece earlier. Um, and he's one of my oldest and best friends. Now he's maybe about 10 years older than me. But he uh, he actually listened to me. And he actually helped let me form this group called the Neo Ancestralist. So I wanted to take him and immortalize him forever. And that's what I did right there. Now he's he's a little sick now. He has Alzheimer's and everything. So he sometimes he recognizes me and sometimes he simply don't. But that's why I did Tommy. I want I want, and I wanted a face where I modeled it going from a solid graphic black shape to this modeled flake. This, this is a perfect example of me taking graphic design and integrating it with uh, Western art. So, and then one of the other things is like, if you look at his little goatee beard and somebody said to me, they said, Jimmy, you should not draw every hair on somebody's head. They said, don't do it. All you do is just put a little blob there and then put some highlights and you're done. So I didn't think that person knew what the heck they were talking about. So I says, good. If nobody else is going to do it, I'm going to do it. So I started drawing this beard. And if you look at it, you can see pieces of the beard way back in the colors, send some pieces back, and then some colors brought it. Once I did that, I says, wow, I've got to do that every chance I get a chance to mess with hair. So that's my piece of Tommy. Am I doing okay on time, Kat? You're doing great, Jimmy. Keep it up. Okay. And, and this piece right here is uh, a young lady. She came to model for me, and she, could, she couldn't model because she just lost her job. And since she lost her job, she, she was crying. So I says, well, she's on my dime. But I didn't want to be hard-hearted and say, well, I'm paying you. You, you, you got to sit there and let me paint you. And so this person actually, what they did is they, they gave me a second where they were able to wipe the tears away and just sort of look at me. But then after I looked at her closely, I saw that her hair was the integration of our culture. It was the integration of our culture. So I just loved the way her hair and uh, the little piece that's hanging down on the back, she told me, she says, Jimmy, can I, can I pull that up? I said, oh, no, don't you touch that, man. That gives that whole face and everything some character. Now, one of the things that I, I did also, if you look at that panel over there with the three squares in it, that panel is all, it's the tech, it's, it shows you my technique all at once right there. It's got the raw umber, the burnt umber, and the blue in there. The blue looks like black, but the black mixed with the burnt umber actually turns black. So it looks like that. And also, I asked when the, Earlier when I showed you the piece where the museum people came to visit me and spend a day with me, I asked them what makes a, a piece of art good or a piece of art in a museum. And, and, and both people said, it's got to be juicy and it's got to have brush strokes all over. Well, <laughs> I don't paint like that. So I put that panel in there just for museum people with the big brush strokes and all that stuff because I don't do that. But I did that as a joke to myself. And I don't know why I'm telling you guys all this stuff, but I did that as a joke to myself. So when they look at it, they go, oh, it's got big brush strokes. In it. But I just did that as fun. So anyway, let me move on. I'm sorry, guys. Uh, this 
this piece is a piece with a, a model that came over and her name is Joy. And I just thought that Joy looked like the type of person that was looking for home. And so that's why I put that little pagoda in there. So she's looking that way. And then she had on a flowered dress and it would have taken me a lifetime to draw those itty bitty flowers. So I blew them up big and put those flowers on there. And then I used my technique to make the flowers look like they were actually part of the, the garment, but it really is not. Those are all just the same flower over and over again. But I realized by the way you handle the, uh, the, the, the grooves and stuff in there, that it made the flowers look like they were part of that garment. And that was a big breakthrough for me. Now that I've shown you, you can look at it differently, but that's what we're here for. And that's Little Joy. And this is a young artist who, who came by the studio. They were 16 at the time. They're a little bit older now, but they brought their little cell phone with them. And it was like a, a, a prediction of how young people can't live without their cell phone. And if you see that cell phone, it's not one of, of a contemporary venue, it's an old one. And I just thought that was neat to put that in there. Now this painting is a perfect example of me putting graphics in the background in the painting on, on the front. That's, so, a, that's a great tie-in, Jimmy. We actually have another question um, from here. Michael, your buddy Michael Kobash. He uh, said, also a lot of geometric shapes, i.e. circles and triangles, squares, that seem too deliberate to be arbitrary. Any significance, question mark? Um, and then additionally, we had another person that was curious about the origin of the uh, shapes that and patterning within your work. Um, you had mentioned drawing upon uh, African textiles, certainly, right? Um, yeah. but but you've made them your own. Can you talk a little bit about that journey? Well, one of the things I had seen was the ladies from G's Ben, and they had created uh, quilts and everything that looked like 20, 20th century modernist art. So I, I, I says, my God, that's, that's an African invention as well. So there's nothing wrong with more than one culture discovering the exact same thing. And there's nothing wrong with, with more than one culture borrowing from another culture. So this is me borrowing from everything that I've seen. And if you look up there, I got those damn brush strokes on there too, right above it. That's for the museum people to look at. It has not, it's just, it's me having fun. So sometimes you can take your art way too, too serious. You sometimes you've got to sit back and just have fun and enjoy it with it. But since I am a designer, I like to design shapes. And I was trying to show how the shapes actually work with the body. If you removed her away, it should be as interesting a painting as if you put her in there. But none of the geometric shapes are arbitrary. And I, I took the little foot there and just broke that line of the yellow square, just so I wouldn't be squeezing it in there trying to make it fit just like a designer would. I'm, I'm, I'm current, right there with that little foot in that shadow coming over there, I'm showing you that I'm a artist now. <laughs> Cat, I'm an artist. So I broke the grid of the lines and everything, but it's still there. So that's one of the things I did with that painting. Does that help? Oh, I think so. I, I think that you can also really see all of those elements within this piece. Um, you, as a designer, know how to carry an eye through a piece of work, right? So you have that nearly awkward tangency where the foot just breaches the line and then up at the shoulder right there between the blue and the red. That's another, you know, it just gives that tension that pulls your eye around um the work so absolutely I, I see it in all of that for sure and um i i appreciate the commentary on the brush strokes but 
in the same token, you go to those museums and you see plenty that don't have it too. So I think your style of making work is so unique. It is like anytime I see your work, I'm like, that's Jimmy. Like, you know it right off the, there's no, there's no confusing it. So I just, I think you're already doing it. You don't have any, you don't have to have anyone telling you uh, exactly what's needed within it. I think it's already there. Oh, we have a comment. Um, love your approach to your process in creating your work. The mingling of serious and humor into your artwork. Uh, this viewer gets to see you, the artist, a different kind of self-portrait. Thank you. Well, thanks. Thanks very much. And, and tell Mike why I said hi. <laughs> Okay, this is this is a piece of I went upstairs to make a painting of one of the photographers who photographed my work for me upstairs. When I was up there um, uh, shooting photographs of, of the photographer, uh, this lady was in the background and she is the uh, makeup artist, hairstylist and all that kind of stuff. Well, she's in the background. And she was very, very young. And so she started dancing. She was dancing around, you know, making all these young gestural movements and everything. And I said, well, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll paint you also. But if I paint you, and I might be giving away too much because the next painting shows it better. You're just gonna have to be a little bit more still. And so she was looking at me, giving me kind of a straightforward look, but I won't tell you no more than that. But I'll tell you one more thing. In the background, the day I was painting this painting, on the news, because we were talking about the news before, was the burning of the, uh, what is that? The, the, the church uh, in, in Paris. The Notre Dame. Notre Dame, is, it started to burn. So I made my own version of that. So I could always remember that when I was working on this painting, Notre Dame was burning right in front of me on the television set. So I still, I still keep up with the news, but I try not to have it dictate what I'm doing. One of the hard parts of this was just getting the jacket to look like leather. I hope it does. This was the photographer upstairs. And this painting is called A New Dawn. So I did two versions of him. And if you look at that close, uh, Kat, this will this will uh, kind of combine with what you were asking me about. Is there a rhyme or reason for using colors in a certain way? Now, if you look at the two images, they are actually painted at different stages of my process. The bigger one is an earlier process. And the, the second one, the smaller one, has the next levels of colors in there. And if you notice, if you look at his hair, and you look at his hair, it does that. And then also the clothes on there, the, the, the African garb is a formal garb. And he didn't have that on when I painted him. <laughs> he just had on a gray t-shirt. But I have that suit, it's like a tuxedo. And so I just allowed the colors, it's called a new done. So one part of it was him screaming and I, I really wanted to make that mouth look real and I wanted to feel distressing. And then I wanted his face to feel just a little bit more calm and just a little bit more integrated with a, a better time. And the background is the African patterns and quilts that we had talked about. This is another model that came to the studio. And what I did with, this was one of the first ones I started to use the wedges with. So I, I put wedges in there. I don't limit myself to one race, one, one gender, one anything. I believe the whole human race has something to offer. And I know that's contradictory to some people's thoughts, but not mine. This is called a prelude 
to uh, after the hunt. And I would rather people ask me questions about this than me tell them about it. Because once I tell you what it's about, it loses its impact. So if you have questions, either let, let Kat know or let me know toward the end. And I will tell you all about this painting. We'll pull it back up. And this painting is about Auschwitz. And I was, I was saying that if, if Christ, who was a young Jewish man, according to the Bible, if he were to come back, he would go to Auschwitz just like the rest of these young guys did. And I just thought that was sad. And this one's called The Two Liberties. And it's kind of showing how America is splitting up into two liberties and two different ways of seeing freedom. And this is the painting I wanted to get to. Whoops, sorry, sorry, sorry. This painting is, is the young lady that you saw before, but this was when I told her to be still and be and to calm down just a little bit so I could paint her. She was looking at me like, you're not my dad. I can do whatever I want to do. Don't, don't try to control me. So I said, now that's the look I want. I didn't say that at the time, but I did once I got a chance to think about it. And I think, guys, I'm at the end of the image section, but and I want to show some of the shows that are coming up that I'm going to be part of now in the near future. Dean. That's wonderful, Jimmy. Um, yeah, folks, so have a look here. These are exhibits that uh, Jimmy is in, obviously, currently. Um, the biennial juried exhibition is actually going to travel uh, up to the northeast to the Medici Museum in Warren, Ohio. So it'll have uh, another life there, which is really exciting. It'll be up uh, from February to May. So if you're in that area, have a look out for that. And then also the Black Life as Subject Matter is coming to the right. So if you haven't had a chance to see it at Springfield or aren't, are closer to Columbus than Springfield, you'll have a chance to see it at the right, which is also really exciting. Um, and Jimmy, we're right at time. So the, the questions that interspe interspersed throughout this um, were really wonderful, I think, added flavor to it. We also had a, a nice comment from a viewer, truly phenomenal body of work by an amazing artist. So interesting to hear the origins of Jimmy's creative process. So hats well, off to you, Jimmy. Really wonderful nice. job. Can yeah, I say so hi to somebody whose name's on there? I'd like to say hi, Cassie. What? <laughs> All right, we see some folks uh, giving the clapping signal, so I'm going to go ahead and close this out. Thank you again, Jimmy, and thank you all for joining us for this Artist Talk by Jimmy Jones as a part of our programming for the 2021 Biennial Juried Exhibition. I'd like to give a special thank you to our jurors, April Tsunami, Jessamy Jones, and Kevin Lyles, as well as to the Ohio Arts Council's board, the Ohio legislature, and the governor who support the OAC, this great space, and of course, Ohio artists. Thank you all and have a great day. <laughs>